This week on Kentucky Afield. Oh man, that fish come off. Came back and hit it again. Kayaks not only give you access to more water, they're also a lot of fun. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Next, Kentucky's white bass run is historic and very popular. We're on the Nolan River. Here we go. Trying to put a pattern together. A little bit of fresh water. Question is, what have we got here? Then, one thing that no outdoors person enjoys, ticks. We're talking to the experts to find out what can be done to keep them at bay. We gotta understand their biology and we gotta understand how we interact with them. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Mercy Leo! Yeah, we're here to get the keeper. Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Wow, that happened. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. You know of a body of water that's not real accessible to bank fishing? Well maybe you should give kayak fishing a try. Oh my gosh, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I am so sick of cold weather and ice storms. So March and April, just happens to be the perfect month to come out and catch pre-spawn largemouth bass. It's a great time of year to take a chance on catching a giant, but we've got a nice breeze. So I'm gonna start out throwing reaction style baits, bladed jigs, swim baits, spinner baits, out in the kayak, no snow, no ice. This is gonna be fun. Here we go. What do we got here? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh, my first bass out of this pond. My first bass out of this pond has got to be seven and a half pounds or better. Oh my gosh, look at that. Very, very first bite. We're going to the shallow water. I think there's gonna be a lot of bass down here. I don't think there's a lot this size, <laughs> but, but I hope there is. Check this fish out, I mean, way more than my whole hand in its mouth there. I do have a scale. I almost gotta know what this thing weighs. Seven pounds, six ounces. I think bad when your very first bite is seven pounds, six ounces, it's worth all the hassle. I'm telling you, this is a place that's not easy to get to. I got a lot of wind blowing, which is great for fishing. If you can find a watershed like this that doesn't get a ton of pressure, March and April are the months to come out here and potentially catch a fish of a lifetime. Since it's my very first fish that I've caught here, I don't know that I'm not gonna catch a bigger one, but you know what? It's already worth the trip. Seven pounds, six ounces. Let's get this thing back in the water. Man, we've only got three feet of water right here. That's why it's a really good idea if you can to bring a depth finder. I mean, you could always try to check it this way, but I know I've got three feet of water and the temperature keeps rising. Now we're almost at 54. There we go. Looky there. Beautiful two pounder here. This one hit a spinner bait up here in this shallow, shallow, shallow water. Now there's a mud line right here in front of me. Right on the other side of it, it looks like it gets about another six, eight inches deeper. And that's where this fish was setting. So that mud line makes its way around. I don't have a big area there, but I got a feeling there may be more. Oh man, that fish come off. Came back and hit it again. Looks about like the one I just caught. They are in here and they are choking this spinnerbait down. Here we go. 
This is a little better fish here. There you go. I'll tell you what, you come out here and there's nothing more fun than running a spinner bait in real shallow water. And all I'm doing is I'm pulling this bait just fast enough to keep it off the bottom. I don't want to pull it too fast, but if I keep my rod tip way up in the air and keep the bait just an inch or two off the bottom, man, they're just sitting here feeding up, getting ready for that spawn. You can see that it's got a big fat belly. Man, when they hit a spinnerbait, you just see your line take off running. And uh, that's exactly what that joker just did. Oh, do you see that thing swell right there at the boat? That thing tried to get in the kayak with me. It literally was four feet from the boat when he hit. I'll tell you what, shallow water, early March, April, spinnerbait fishing, it, it doesn't get much more fun than this right there. Here we go. <laughs> now they're about a two pounder here on this spinnerbait. Here we go. Oh, I lost him right there. there. Oh, there he is. Oh, it's a little bitty one. I'll tell you what, if you know of a watershed that uh, is shallow and is really, really hard to fish in the summer, consider getting on it early in the year before that vegetation comes up. And a kayak is a great, great way to access a body of water like this. And man, I'll tell you what, if you want to catch really, really big fish, come out early. And I mean, starting in March, early March. And if you're in for numbers, then you might want to make it later on in, uh, in April. But uh, throwing a uh, Colorado, or excuse me, a uh, willow blade spinnerbait, a swim jig, a bladed jig, a swim bait, something that you can move slow in really shallow water is such a great way to target these fish. And it's a lot of fun. Oh, here we go. I tell you what, I've had a blast today. This is a watershed lake that was actually impounded in the 40s or 50s. And the reason for this impoundment was to make this land more fertile. They thought it would sit here for about 10, 15 years, drain out, and the land would be more fertile and be used for crops and, and actually for growing tobacco. Well, it never drained. And now here we are, literally 70, 80 years later, and this impoundment is fantastic for catching fish. You've probably heard of Kentucky's historic white bass runs. And if you've ever wanted to give it a try, Right now is your time. Well, it's mid-March, and here in Kentucky, that means it is time to catch crappie. And you know what? Also, white bass. It's a little bit early. They're not really pulled and staged into areas really tight, so we've elected to do it a little different today, and that is bring a boat. You know, you don't have to have a boat to white bass fish. Matter of fact, usually I prefer it from the bank, but when the fish are moving like they are now, we're gonna try to use the electronics and move up and down this river to find them staging on these shoals. The water is falling and a little bit stained. I'll tell you what, it's a little bit early in the year, but because of some really warm rains that we've had, we're already almost 52 degrees, so the temperature is right. Hopefully, today we can catch a couple of them, because man, it sure is fun. Maybe pound for pound, one of the hardest fighting fish we have here in the state of Kentucky. We came up the river here and uh, there's a little inlet with, with a waterfall on it. Fresh, clean, clear water. And it's probably just due to the fact that it's supposed to be 70 degrees, probably a little warmer. So uh, we're gonna set out here, see if there's any fish in here. Here we go. A little bit of fresh water. The question is, what have we got here? White bass. It's my first white bass of 2021. Hey, these are great to eat. If I can get enough of these to make a mess, I'd be pretty happy. 
You see that right there? This here is a male, and the males will actually run up this river before the females. They get a little bit excited. This is this is milt from a fish, so this is uh, this is definitely a, a male fish. So um, you know what? Hopefully, we find some females. As with most fish species, the males are the small ones, so the females will be bigger. We fished this spot, made several more casts with no luck. It's time to move. We're moving up to the next shoal, skinnier water, more current. Hopefully that's where they're at. <laughs> Need a spinnerbait? This is such a great walk-in opportunity. Looks like he's throwing something that's got a little pink on it, and uh, it's got him a nice white bass. I do like that sheer rock wall. It might have some depth right on the edge. Here we go. A little bitty one, but yeah, is this a crappie? Sure is. A little crappie. This one is not going to be big enough to keep. That thing's about six inches long. Not quite enough. Sometimes it's the smallest amount of influx of water it can just change the oxygen in here. And so you see here's a little bit of a drain coming in. So this is a spot that I'm gonna wanna give a try. And here, there's another one. See, they're, they're in there. You'd never think that that little bit of water right there would be enough, but this is a better fish. I don't know what it is. Hope it lets us know. White bass. Here we go. Just a little bitty spot with some inflow of water. And two casts in a row, two fish. Need about uh, 10 of these. Here we go. <laughs> you can tell it's got this rod just doubled over how hard these things fight. It's not a huge fish, but they're just so incredibly strong. Another male fish. You know, the females are obviously the ones hauling the eggs, so you really can come up here and catch your limit in these males, and you're not really hurting the population much, but it's definitely a male. Here, here we go. Another white bass. Man, that is sitting right against that rock wall. So. We floated a lot of this river today, and it seems like the spots where we're getting fish held up are either where there's an influx of water or where you've got a little bit of just a sheer drop where the water's a little bit deeper and there's not as much current. That seems to be where they're at. Here we go. Coming right at the boat. Nice fish right there. Again, it's it's just putting that pattern together. And for whatever reason, every day it changes. You might have it where you got a lot of flow and it just drops into a pool and they'll be right in the middle. Today, they are right on the edge of the banks in these little areas where you got a slight bit of slack water and a little bit of depth right on sheer rock. Hey, we're gonna mess around here and, uh, and get us a limit of white bass. You know, it's early. So this is usually, you know, you're, you're looking right around the last week of March to April is really when this starts to happen. This year we've had some warm weather. As a matter of fact, when I get this fish in, I'm getting this jacket off. It is getting hot. this sheer rock wall again. That's a little joker there, but still fights like crazy out here in this current. I'll tell you what, we just made about a two or 300 yard float trying to fish everything, not a bite. Next sheer rock wall, there it is, caught a fish. This one's a little smaller. It is a male though, big enough to clean. Well, I'll tell you what, coming here and floating this uh, Nolan River is a great way to spend an afternoon in March. We're a little early, but everybody's catching fish. So we talked to a lot of people and it seemed like everyone had caught either crappie or white bass, just not big numbers yet. But you know what? 
I bet you about the last week of March, first week of April, it's gonna be the place to be right here. Before you hit the woods this spring, make sure you take the precautions needed to protect yourself against ticks. We're outside today with Jonathan Larson with the University of Kentucky Entomology Department. And you guys do a ton of research. Yeah, we got a lot of bugs here in Kentucky. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Most of them are kind of indifferent, but we got to understand that. We got to understand their biology and we got to understand how we interact with them. So you guys have got an entire program that study their impact on nature and landscape is also their impact on people. Yeah, we have a lot of basic research that goes on in the department. People trying to understand the insects themselves, looking at the way they smell, looking at the way they survive being frozen over over the winter. We have some people working on protecting pollinators like bees and monarchs. We have others that do stuff like I do, which is look at crop pests or ornamental pests. And we have a lot of folks that are focusing in on that human health aspect. One of the human health aspects is ticks. Yes. Ticks in Kentucky have a real interesting history. So we're trying to figure out just where they are, what all the species are. We have a real good handle on who lives here, but not exactly every county that they live in. And so we want to be able to teach people what risks they may be encountering if they're going outside in a certain place. And we definitely want to help them keep themselves safe. And we're going to talk to one of these individuals that are studying ticks right here in the state of Kentucky. That's right. So what got you interested in studying ticks? Originally, I was interested in any kind of vector disease. So okay. ticks are big vectors for public health diseases. And I had an opportunity to work with Kentucky Department of Public Health on their tick surveillance. And I took it, and I, I love it. It's a lot of fun. So for people that spend a lot of time outdoors, our turkey season is right around the corner here in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And in April, ticks are starting to come out. Tell me a little bit about what times of the year and types of areas that ticks are most prevalent. So ticks are active in really humid areas. As it gets closer to the summer, it gets a little hotter outside, they'll become more active. And you'll find them in areas of like forest and field habitat. So areas where you're gonna hunt for, like you said, turkey or any other animals. They like to stay pretty hidden. So in grassy fields or they'll hide on the edges of branches like this and wait for a host to come by and grab onto you. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be hard to see on, on yeah. and sometimes really small, but especially if you're wearing camo, they can really hide on there. Yes. So tell me what you would do if you're gonna go out turkey hunting, hiking, what you would do to prevent becoming a host for a tick. So the first thing that you wanna do is provide some kind of insecticide. Permethrin is the best. You just apply it to your clothes and then it can work for several days after application. That way you don't have to put it on your skin they get onto the permethrin and crawl around for a little bit, they die off. What would you recommend as far as a chemical that people would apply to themselves to keep ticks off of them? DEET is a good one to use. Most insecticide repellents that you can buy at the store will have a list of the insects that they repel. Mm -hmm. And any of the ones that say ticks are probably a good choice. DEET can come from levels from 10% to nearly 100%. Yeah. Tucking your pants into your socks, wearing high socks and boots is really effective. You really just want to think about what is the best way that I can cover myself so that the ticks cannot reach my skin. Okay. So duct taping your socks around your ankles, tucking your shirt into your pants, wearing a bandana around your neck. Those are things that are going to provide a barrier between the ticks and you. I know that when you are out in any kind of habitat where ticks may be, it's always a good idea to do tick checks mm -hmm. every once in a while. How much does re removing the tick pretty quickly help and avoid any type of tick-borne illnesses? It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Now once that tick attaches to you, if it's carrying that bacteria, it needs about 36 hours before you become infected. Okay. So if you can remove the tick as soon as you see it, that is essential. So when you do get a tick on you, you found one that's been embedded. There's a million ways that people have talked about removing ticks. Yes. Tell me what you recommend. So there's one safe way to remove a tick. When it embeds into you, you want to take a pair of tweezers, get as close to the skin as you can, pull on the tick straight up until it lets go. People will say twist the tick. Um, that can cause the mouth parts to break off and while the most of the body of the tick will come off, those mouth parts will still be embedded in okay. your skin. Some people have some allergies to ticks. What type of allergies would you have to be concerned with? One of the big allergies is red meat allergy. Okay. Um, this is something that's usually picked up from the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick in the saliva has a sugar molecule called alpha-gal. 
So I'm here today with Dr. Turbyville, and I was recently speaking to some entomologists at UK, and they were telling me about some allergies from ticks. It's called what? Galactose alpha-1,3 galactose is the whole name, but it's okay. uh, most people shorten it as alpha-gal. People have been talking about it now for a couple years here in the state of Kentucky, but it's been around for quite some time. It was first reported around 2008, but it's probably been around longer because we know there were case reports as far back as 1989 where patients had reactions to meat that we look back and say that was probably alpha-gal. It resides in pretty much hooved animals, is that right? Alpha-gal is a sugar. Most allergies are protein. So like if you're allergic to peanuts or shellfish, it's a protein that you're reacting to. You react almost immediately when you eat it. Whereas with alpha-gal, it's a delayed reaction. So it's like two to six hours after you eat the meat. And it's only mammalian meat. So mostly beef and pork, but it can be in deer. It can be in any mammal, basically. Okay. I would say compared to allergies like peanut and shellfish, it tends to be more mild reactions that we see. Usually hives is the most common thing. But there's a subset of patients that just gets abdominal pain and distress and they'll have that again, usually delayed a couple hours after they eat. And I've seen a few patients who just had swelling, like lip swelling, and they didn't have the hives with it. But most people will have hives and itching. Is this a lifelong diagnosis? So for most, it is not. The Lone Star Tick is the primary vector that passes it. So they'll get bit by the tick, and then their levels of alpha-gal will go up. And then over time, as long as they don't keep getting bit by the tick, it'll fall, usually to a level where they can tolerate meat again. But then if they get bit again and resensitize, that level can go up higher. So there's no guarantee that it can't come back, even if it's gone away. If you were to have someone come in, and would, you would not tell them to avoid their passion and activities of being outdoors, right? No, absolutely not. You need to take reasonable precautions. Try to avoid getting the ticks on you. Check yourself for ticks, but I would not discourage people from going out in the woods and doing what they enjoy doing. I think it also underscores the importance of what you guys do at Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife because we know that the tick population mirrors the deer population. For that reason, I would tell people don't stop hunting. You know, we need to do what we can to help control the population. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have Sarah Atkins with a nice trout from Paintsville Lake. Nice catch. Here we have the Atkins family from McGoffin County. Looks like they went deer hunting and had a lot of luck. First is Case, then Connor, and Father Sean. Nice job. I'm not sure who's more excited, Ruby Downs or Pawpaw, after catching her first bass ever in his pond. Nice job. Check out this nice Estill County buck that was taken by Woody Patrick. This is a 10 pointer that was taken with a crossbow. Here we have a nice walleye over 23 inches long that was caught by Charlie Gibbs of E-Town. This fish came out of Nolan Lake. Here we have six year old Silas Butts from Henryville, Indiana with a nice black crappie. Congratulations. This beautiful picture of a nice long ear sunfish caught by Liam Burtons, his first fish ever, reminds me of summer. Here we have eight-year-old Gabriel Bevins with a nice deer, a six-pointer taken in Morgan County, Kentucky. Seven-year-old Bentley Jones took his very first deer from McQuarrie County. This is his first buck, a nice six-pointer. 10-year-old Emmy Wright took this nice doe in Mead County, Kentucky. Bailey Johnson of Shelbyville, Kentucky took her very first deer while hunting with her boyfriend, Zach Wheeler. Congratulations. Here we have a beautiful Rowan County buck taken with a crossbow by nine-year-old Kelsey Sorrell. Nice job. Check out the size of this nice largemouth bass caught by three-year-old S.J. Vance. This fish was caught in a pond in Poole, Kentucky. Here we have a beautiful nice buck, an eight-pointer taken by Kaylee Miracle. This deer was taken with a 223. Nice job. Happy Easter from all of us here at Kentucky Field. I hope you and your family made time to get outdoors. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. Dip, dip, dip. Let's go. More Kentucky Field is available at your fingertips. Whether by smartphone or computer, you'll find exclusive content and behind the scenes videos on our social media pages. Give us a like or follow to stay in the woods and on the water longer. When you subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, just search Kentucky Field on your favorite app. 
I'm Chad Miles, host of Kentucky Field, the longest running outdoor show in the nation. I've had the privilege of watching Kentucky's elk herd grow to the largest east of the Mississippi, attaining Boone and Crockett status. And I've shared in some amazing elk hunts along the way. Guys, I'm telling you, that's my max shot right there. <laughs> this year, nearly 600 tags are available to the public. And you can take your pick of tags to put in for and possibly go on the hunt of a lifetime. Simply apply by April 30th for your chance to hunt elk right here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm.